Good morning, folks. Ooh, hi. That's loud. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for waking up and showing up. I appreciate it. Um, I'm Lulu Lemaire. I'm a producer uh, in the Daydream Publishing Group at Google, working to support de developers like y'all to get your apps onto our smartphone, AR, and VR platforms, which are Tango and Daydream, respectively. So as an introduction, um, I started working as a producer in games a uh, producer type person in um, 1999. I was working at a company called Looking Glass, uh, which was sort of famous at the time for its sort of unique approach to immersive gaming. Uh, they made a style of games called Immersive Sims, if you're a super nerd and remember that stuff. Um, since then, I've, I've worked in um, development and publishing at big companies and little indie companies. And I've been a lot of, been through, of course, just by dint of sticking around for a long time, through a lot of hardware transitions and a few kind of big shifts in the way that we think about games and other interactive content. Though I'm not sure that any have been as potentially profound as the one that we're in the midst of right now. Um, so we're all here, I'm here, because I'm excited and hopeful about the future of AR and VR. Um, and we at Google have worked with hundreds of developers to bring apps and games to Tango and Daydream. Um, and on the content side, we're so proud of the, of the really different and unique content that folks have brought into the world. And after this kind of first round, Daydream was released uh, towards the end of last year, Tango um, earlier in the same year. And so we've sort of had one round of content uh, for AR and VR, and there's some kind of nuggets that are kind of crystallizing out of this, and some common characteristics among apps that are getting both attention from users and uh, more time in the headset. So I want to talk about some of those kind of common characteristics and speculate about a little bit about um, where they might go, where that where that might lead. Um, and I don't just want to talk about stuff that's working. I also want to talk about um, the, the real deterrence to um, folks spending more time in VR. Google wants to reach everybody and for AR to be accessible and meaningful to the broadest possible audience. And so we really, we have to think about these deterrents also because they're, they're a real thing for, for basically every VR platform. Um, we have a, a long way to go before we're going to see uh, VR or AR, XR, right, as a dominant computing metaphor or even as a dominant hobby that a large number of people are spending a lot of their time on. Um, so we really need to talk about these deterrents and sort of be realistic about facing them, uh, how y'all can sidestep these things as you're developing your next apps. So here's the, the quick agenda of what I'll talk about. A couple things that are working involve narrative uh, and spatial successes, good relationships to the spatial world, uh, and a couple of deterrents, which sort of boil down to other people, IRL, and um, some metaphors that I think are interesting to think about when creative, creating immersive uh, interactive experiences. So let's talk about involved narrative first um, and how our experience of story and characters are kind of amplified in VR. The, the agency that you have just by controlling your view means that in VR you are structurally involved in the narrative. Like a neutral viewpoint is hard to conceive of because this control, this agency that you have, and it's, it is really compelling. So we're seeing games with involved narrative content having a lot of appeal for its users. And so I want to talk a little about my history and, and sort of a precursor to what, what involvement means. So as a sort of pre-VR seed of involved content, I was working on some Tomb Raider games years ago. Um, and when on this team, I was really interested to hear that People who play Tomb Raider don't feel, they don't identify with Lara Croft. They don't feel like they are her. They feel like they are protecting her. And they're sort of, they have this affectionate feeling towards her. And 
the relationship between Lara and like her third person sort of controller operator is really one-sided. Like you, you can feel like you're, you are protecting her and that you're, but your presence doesn't mean a thing to her, right? Um, it kind of works with Lara's character that is, uh, it's hard to know where that came from. Her aloofness and distance comes from this, this concept of identification versus pr protecting her. But um, the distance between you and the character, the one-sidedness of the relationship um, is kind of what she's all about. She's unattainable, unreachable. You can see her here sitting in judgment of you. <laughs> you feel connected to her, but the feeling is not mutual. Um, so uh, I want to talk about this game along together um, that Turbo Button made, and is this GIF working? It's not working. There we go, yes. Okay, uh, this game came out last week. Um, you can play it actually at the demo area outside. And it's kind of the same concept. You, the player, are controlling a third person character. In this case, you're helping a kid through a bunch of navigation challenges. But helping is important here. Instead of like a non-entity operator thing, you're someone, you're this kid's imaginary friend, and you can sort of see the visualization of your, of, uh, your hand in the world. Um, so by virtue of, there's two kids in the game, so this is the other kid, and she often, the, both kids will often turn and look at you and sort of gaze at you, like that's the other side of the relationship. They're acknowledging your help. Um, and acknowledging that you are also a person in their life. Um, by virtue of this perspective and the kind of presence that you have, you're already more structurally involved in the narrative. Um, they use that as, in Along Together, they use it as a starting point to develop a relationship, this relationship between the player and the game character. So if you're, if you're making a narrative-focused experience, you have a unique opportunity to form meaningful co connections with the characters through this involved feeling of the camera and, and of course, the eye contact afforded by VR. Um, there are plenty of anecdotal data to suggest that if users care about the characters, then uh, they, they'll stay with the content through multiple iterations. The example that I'm thinking of is uh, Jane Austen, man, people love Elizabeth Bennet. Like, I also enjoy Jane Austen's writing, but the main character of Pride and Prejudice is so appealing and charming to people that they're into Bridget Jones, which is like a spinoff, and what are, um, uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, is that, you know? People will stay with the content if they feel connected and involved with the characters. So one last note uh, on involved narrative is about multiplayer. Um, this relationship, this like very simple relationship I'm talking about is formed by helping the character and having your help be noticed and acknowledged, right? That's the basic building blocks of relationships in the world. And this is something that is totally familiar to uh, users and, and makers of MMOs. They maintain and build real relationships among people. So, um, how much more interesting are those relationships in VR in a uh, simultaneous multiplayer world? And I think there are opportunities for making multiplayer simultaneous collaborative narrative pieces outside of the context of a giant world MMO. Um, a trend that's really interesting in the, in the real world space right now is these um, escape rooms for the collaboration among players and sort of this physical presence. And the, those experiences are also a little bit more bite-sized and less life-consuming than an MMO and might be a really interesting analog to the kind of session links that we see in VR. So on to the next. Um, when we ask folks what prevents them from spending more time in VR, of course there's like the logistical hurdles of getting in and out and the discomfort from the weight of the headset or, or the heat. Um, but beyond those things that are fixable, we know those things are fixable with time and tech. And as a content person, I'm not about to talk or speculate on those. Um, but one big reason that people limit their time in VR is the social discomfort. Um, 
when you're in VR, you remove yourself from everyone else who might be in the room or in your house. I am really hyped about asymmetrical VR um, as a way to address that isolation. And by asymmetrical, um, if you don't all know, keep talking and nobody explodes, which I'm guessing most of you do. Um, I mean, one player is in VR and the other players are, can participate while physically present, but not in a headset. Uh, tomorrow, Climax Studios is re releasing a game called Lola and the Giant on Daydream. Um, a game that you can play single player in the headset or with an asymmetric co-player on an Android device. Um, the game deals with a bunch of things that are sort of uniquely possible in VR, including this involved narrative of the relationship between Lola and the giant that I talked about before. Um, it also deals with uh, sort of the scale differences between a little girl and a giant. Um, the designer of the game talked recently um, about how the inspiration for this was uh, having, having a baby and how teeny that baby is and what that perspective of being so small might be. And that's the kind of thing that we can explore really wonderfully in VR. Um, the thing that makes uh, Lola really unique is this asymmetrical gameplay relationship. Um, so why do I think that uh, asymmetrical is like a persistent trend instead of an anomaly along the way towards everyone being in headset, you know, five people sitting in the same room all in VR headsets. And I think the question comes down to how completely we expect VR to change and, and remake people's lives versus it fitting into the lives that people already have. You know, it's possible to imagine that VR will be like cars and completely remake our whole landscape and change the way that we interact with people and visit people and changes our exposure to uh, people who are different from us and how often we're exposed to them. But it's reasonable to, ex to assume, at least for, you know, the next medium term, that VR is instead gonna fit into our own familiar ways of relating to each other. Um, which means that I think game developers and sort of experience makers will, are always gonna have something to do as long as people want to have a way to occupy themselves and their friends when they're co-present with each other in real life. So I, want, I also want to talk about media competition. Um, the immersion and the focus afforded by VR isolates us not just from the other people in our lives, but also from other media, including like social media, that we, that we want to consume and that we want to, to enjoy. Um, some surveys that we've seen on folks' usage patterns um, for VR indicate that distraction from other media is really a big reason why people leave VR. Um, I'm sure it's happened to all of you. It happens to me quite a bit. Like, I take the headset off for a second either to tweet about something or, like, just to space out for a second. Maybe um, it's an in-development app and it just crashed or whatever. Like, eh, I'm just going to take a break for a second, space out and look at Facebook. And then one thing leads to another and it's late and I'm just gonna go to bed and I never really make it back in the headset. And so our survey data says that it's not just me, <laughs> uh, it's kind of a lot of people. Um, so obviously any VR, any given VR experience can't compete with the distraction of social media and its constant stream of interesting quips and pictures and all kinds of things from people that you know, right? It, social media is everyone, uh, and it's hard to be better than everyone. <laughs> um, so eventually we know that this distraction and like being taken out of the headset in order to multitask or to engage with something else, that's gonna be addressed at the OS level. It's not always going to be you're only immersed in one thing and you have to take your headset off to do something. And of course, you know, on Vive, for example, you can, you can rig up some sort of trader's desk hellscape right in front of your eyes. Um, 
And I hope, I sincerely, deeply hope that when we address this at the OS level, it doesn't look like that because to me it's a hellscape. Um, but in your, <laughs> in your own game, like what can you even do about this distraction? Like is it this inevitable thing? And besides wait for this systemic change that lets people like write tweets while they're in VR. Um, so there's two things here that I'd, that I'd like you to think about. Um, first, we have to think, we've already been talking about this in video games for years and years. Oh. Um, but we have to think even more now about sort of the slipperiness of the experience. The easiest thing of all things to do in your game needs to con be to continue playing. Um, which really means designing for breaks because people don't want to stay in VR for a four hour stretch because sometimes people have to go to the bathroom or get a drink or something. Um, so when someone gets into the experience and they put their headset on, they're ready for it. Like they're asking to play the game and they're not ready for a break yet. The more barriers you put up towards getting into the experience in that first few moments, the more likely it is that people are going to take the headset off and stop. And we see a ton of sort of failed sessions where people pop into the game or the experience, they stay there for a second, and then they come back out, like less than two minutes. And maybe they just opened up the wrong app, or uh, maybe the phone rang, or whatever. They were distracted in some way. But unless it's really clear how to get in and stay in, it's always appealing to get out and be distracted. So, so you need to think about what you want somebody to accomplish or experience before they get up to the go to the bathroom and front load all of that and make it the easiest choice to do and make it hard to look away until that point comes. So designing for immersion and breaks from immersion offers some kind of protection from distraction, but at some point, we're gonna have more distraction from within the headset. Um, and I expect a huge amount of change over the next few years as we find out what works on the OS level. And, but a lot of you have to solve these same kinds of problems in your own game fiction, in your own world fiction, right? In your virtual world, like your character is going to be interacting with things in, the, in that world. And how do you make it feel real to them and compelling to them when they're interrupted or they need to be given some information or some direction from off screen? Um, in some cases, it's fully grounded, like the telephone rings and like you pick it up um, or you get a text message and you, you know, pick up something in the game world and interact with it, right? Um, but that's not really the only option. And it's not the only kind of world that we might want to conceive of, like science fiction worlds where we don't have telephones, things like this. Um, a good example from, from our catalog is uh, Untethered by Numinous Games. Um, they have this sort of comic book metaphor for, for notifications and interactions. Um, it uses a visual language that we're familiar with from comics. It's eye-catching and it's really easy to understand. Um, whoops. Sorry, I didn't want that flashing gif in your face constantly. Um, it's really easy to understand and it's easy to pick off from the game world because we're used to these kinds of text bubbles being separate and living above the game world, right, from comic books. Whatever we, the platform holders do at the OS level for notifications and real world distractions, they're not gonna be the last word. This first round certainly is not gonna be the last round. It's gonna be the first iteration. It's gonna be weird. It's gonna have all sorts of problems. Um, the issue of virtual distractions within your virtual world, this is, really fertile ground for UX experimentation because it's a significantly lower cost than UX experimentation at the OS level, right? Um, we, as game developers, have already been making AR HUDs for years, right? 
Um, and so this is sort of the next stage. And there's so much more now that's possible. And I, I really look forward to seeing what you all do um, with more space, with gestural controls. Um, I think choice and control really are the most important things to, to think about and explore there um, with competition and notifications. So I wanna talk a little about, we just talked about sort of layered media streams and the competition between multiple things happening simultaneously. Um, but VR is also about this sort of metaphorical layering of, of data and of information. I've, it's very easy to think about this with respect to AR. Um, because you were sort of accreting extra data on top of the real world. Um, and some folks are doing really cool things in museums. Let me see if this works. Um, this is a, a tango project at uh, the Detroit Institute of the Arts um, where with the tango device, you can walk around and explore the skeleton of the mummy, inside the mummy, right? This is, uh, I don't know, this is the most perfect <laughs> museum experience I can imagine. You always want to go inside and see more, right? We've seen other museums uh, sort of decorate uh, their spaces with like living creatures that of course you can't have running around in your museum for real, but visible only through, the, through augmented reality. Um, there's more to, to this kind of layering metaphor um, I'm a, and I'm thinking in particular of layering through time. Um, I'm a little bit obsessed with, uh, with domestic architecture. I've always lived in old houses, and I love seeing how different they become over time as new additions get put on. And, you know, I've lived in, and I currently live in a neighborhood where every house on the block is exactly the same, but they've all been renovated into being unique little snowflakes. Um, these are two examples of, of churches that look, that are basically like two 3D models superimposed on each other in the world. Um, and I, I really, I love the idea of seeing through time um, with VR and AR experiences. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say about that besides like, I want to see these games and these experiences and I really look forward to all of you making them. Um, the whole idea of different information and even sort of different worlds layering on top of each other, this, this idea scratches a particular itch that I've had since, like, since I was a little kid when I read the Narnia books. I'm a total sucker for any fiction with parallel universes. I, it's like kryptonite. So I was really excited to play Virtual Virtual Reality, which is a game about those layers, sort of coexisting and in some cases getting tangled. Um, what you see in this screenshot is the headsets within the game that sm smoosh onto your face, sort of swoop onto your face like birds and take you into a, a different reality within that reality, within another reality. You can see it at, our, at the demo area outside. So this is an example of sort of structurally exploring these layered universes. Um, and literally exploring these layers, like with the Tango Museum apps. Um, I think there's a whole lot more out there to explore on the, sort of on the metaphorical side. So space is the last thing I wanna talk about. Um, I spent a lot of time, out, time outdoors as a kid, and I really just love exploring and looking at things, and specifically like the brain tingling, like ASMR feeling of learning something and then recalling that information, particularly spaces. Um, and the reason that it's so enjoyable, I think, I imagine, is because we're built for this, like we're hunter-gatherers. I personally identify as a gatherer, I don't know about you guys. Um, so the appeal of this space and memory making um, and the way XR, VR, and AR both play with that, like that is my number one reason for, for being in VR. As far as I'm concerned, VR is spatial media. 
So like as a gatherer, I really love browsing. I like bookstores and record stores and because it's discovery of the unexpected that's peppered through with familiar things um, that give you some assurance that the unfamiliar thing next to it is something that you might also enjoy and love and trust as much as the familiar thing, right? But discoverability has been pretty problematic since we started shopping on the web and buying things on the web. So I think we can solve it in VR. I, I really can't wait to see a decent like browsing and discovery focused shopping experience. Let's do it. Um, so now there's a dichotomy between like physical objects and virtual objects. Um, and I, I want you all to think about how that's gonna change when we have virtual space of our own. Um, right now, physical artifacts and like collectibles are an, a pretty meaningful secondary income stream for a lot of g game developers. I'm talking about like the art prints and uh, the to Kelma County Forestry Service mugs and uh, Team Fortress um, collectibles. There's obviously some desire people have to make this, their virtual experiences real in some way and to bring them into the real world. So how does that change when we're in this AR future where you can have virtual experiences that you don't have to have getting dusty in your house but you can just look at whenever you want to? Uh, either through a headset or through a device. Um, and then what kind of virtual, virtual real goods would you want players to be offered or to, to potentially have if they have their own virtual spaces in which to display them? There's just some really interesting line crossing there to think about. Um, the last thing on space that I want us to talk about is, uh, is that space is really made, pres made meaningful by your presence there. A lot of virtual experiences hinge on this thing that I find so brain tingly, people's memory and recall of a space and their interaction within the space, right? Um, it makes the feeler, uh, the feeler used like they're there. The other way around. <laughs> Um, I have a feeling that uh, experiencing the relative motion of near and far objects sort of stitches the space together in your mind. I think that may be the mechanism by which you remember things is seeing them move. Um, but obviously moving around in VR is pretty problematic, like nausea is a thing. Um, our team is releasing a set of best practice demos called uh, Daydream Elements, which includes a, this tuned and configurable tunneling implementation by restricting the peripheral vision, it sort of reduces nausea when moving around. Um, oops, this way. Uh, another recent Daydream title called Eclipse, Edge of Light, um, managed to do this really well with their own, um, they use their own tunneling solution to sort of maintain your presence in the game world, maintain your awareness of the space while making movement really pretty comfortable. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the ways in which VR can mess with our conception of space and what we can parse as real as spaces get more virtual and less real, you know? Um, but we really need to start with a, with a solid concept of what it is that makes things real to us. So I'm gonna finish um, on this quote uh, by Robert Yang. I'm really inspired by this whole blog post, A Progressive Future for VR. In it, he exhorts artists to stay, stay in VR and keep making in stuff in VR while it's still so open to change. And there's so many aspects of VR that are still open to change and open for experimentation. How we involve folks in narrative, how we interact with other people in our life, with VR, how we interact or we don't interact with competing media and int uh, information that's competing for our attention, what spaces mean and how our brains experience space, and what it means to have multiple versions of reality sort of existing side by side. Um, and I trust all of you as creators are answering these questions and I really look forward to being inspired by the solutions that you find. Thank you. Hi, 
Do you have time for questions? Um, I'm not sure. I, I have time, but does the room have time? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Hi, right, thank you so much. This is great content, and I'm glad to see you taking lessons from, uh, from your work and drawing them for us. One of the things I was wondering about is that as we begin to build VR spaces with many people in them, it's clear that abuse and har harassment is a huge issue. Yes. Um, is that something that your team will sort of release? Like, would there be daydream elements with power gestures to handle, you know, dome of power, this conversation? That's right. That's, that's a really excellent question. Um, I am very reluctant to get into social spaces until we have those solutions because uh, you just start a garbage fire and it's going to always be on fire. You know, you, it, it's really hard to, to put out a garbage fire after it's already been started. Um, that's definitely the kind of thing that our team needs to address and needs to be attentive to as we move towards social VR. Um, we are very reluctant as a company to allow for spaces that, um, that support abuse. So. You can talk more to Brian Rose about that in the future. <laughs> That's the guy. <laughs> All right, y'all can uh, email me or find me later if you have any other questions. Thanks so much.